a guy give me a gospel track. You, you folks hand out a lot of tracks. Guy give me a gospel track, and I, in order to read it, it took me three days to read it. So I sprang my ankle and went down into sick bay, and laid in that bed for three days and read that track. When I was through, I, there was a tremendous change took place in my heart and in my soul. I mean, from that day forward, it was from light to darkness. But I never got assurance of my salvation. Didn't get it. I was I was doubtful. I was uh, I didn't know. So uh, I was walking down the street one day, and a guy from some church come up and started witnessing to me and sat down on the bench there, and he went through the plan of salvation, and I got saved again, <laughs> right there on the bench. And that was okay. I was amen. I was all right with me. And uh, oh, a couple more weeks went by. I went back aboard ship. A couple more weeks went by. And I was upstairs in the servicemen center. And some guy was in there witnessing, and he started witnessing to me, and he set me down in the chair, and I got saved all over again. <laughs> Went through the whole thing, man. I was gonna, I was still uh, looking for assurance, but uh, I went through the whole thing. And uh, on I went, went by some more time, went by, and one time I heard Dr. Ruckman preach. And he preached on, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And I said, that's it. All I have to do is receive Jesus Christ as my Savior, period. So I went back aboard ship, went down in one of the gas stations there for the airplanes, got down on that thing at night, and got down on my hands and knees and said, Lord, if I'm lost and going to hell, I want Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I'm going to ask him to come into my heart right now. And if I've never done it before, right now is the time I want to trust your blood to save my soul. And I've never had a doubt since that time. Amen. Well, I could say four or five times, maybe. <laughs> but probably just once. <laughs> Amen? Yeah, where, it started, maybe. where it started? San Diego, San Diego, California. Guy, give me a track. Guy, give me a gospel track. Give me that gospel track. Took that track. San Diego, California, board ship. Sit down. Read that track. And I think that's where the whole thing started, right there. I believe that's where I got saved, right there, that three days. Because I walked out of there, and some guy says, Nathan, what has happened to you? I said, I don't know. Maybe I've become a Christian. So you don't know much. You don't know much. But uh, after a while, although the Holy Spirit starts bearing witness with your heart, and you start believing what God said right in that book, He that hath the Son, and I received Jesus Christ, that's all there is to it. That's it, plain and simple. I received Him, that's finished it, that's it, no more to it. I'm born again. I'm going to heaven when I die. Amen. Amen. Is this water mine? That's yours. <laughs> Need more? Down and get you more. So that began in San Diego, California. So that's some big old church out there witnessing and giving uh, a lot of gospel tracts. And everybody witnessing, I don't know why they targeted Nathan, but they thought he looked like he needed something, and he got it. <laughs> and then it wound up in Pensacola, Florida. And from there, he, uh, Dr. Ruckman taught him to read and read the Bible, and taught him the Bible. And uh, he's in Montana now. Can you believe that? There, to there, to there. <laughs> so praise the Lord for the work of the Lord. Amen. Hi, everybody. It's good to be standing up straight today. Thank you for your prayers. I appreciate them. Backwards.
Lord taught me how to do that. He's good. Amen. morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on shore. You know, you get melancholy. And <laughs> uh, so let's see, Nathan, about uh, 35 years ago, we set a tent up down on whatever street that was. You remember that tent meeting? That yeah, first I remember it. Meeting? I remember and, uh, it. that old braggy old tent there, we used to have to stay there all day and guard that tent. I don't know what for. It would been better if somebody had carried it off, you know. But uh, that was kind of the obligation. And uh, I remember one day I was sitting there watching that tent, and Nathan was coming to relieve me. And I could hear him coming down the street and uh, block away, and he kept getting closer. I mean, right down the middle of the street came Nathan, and he was singing, I'll fly away. So just kind of, you know, to, for the reminiscing of Brother Art Martin 35 years ago, I want Nathan to sing that last verse by himself, and I want him to sing it uh, just like he's coming down the street there. And I'm, I'm uh, getting ready to be relieved of uh, my duty at the tent. Would you sing that last verse, Nathan? All right. <laughs> Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away to a land where joy shall never end. I'll fly away.
hear say one of these days you're going to fly away. I mean fly, man, fly. And I mean to the glory with the Lord Jesus Christ in his presence forever and ever where I'll sin no more. Aren't you glad you're saved? I suppose, but let's go, brother. <laughs> if I ain't ready to preach now, I'll never be ready. <laughs> yes, I'll tell you. Yeah, I think they're on, aren't they, brother? Should be. I uh, ought to tell you my testimony. When was the last time I told this church my testimony? Been a while. First time I was here. That was a long time ago, wasn't it? 85. Now, some of you remember my testimony. I'm going to shorten it up a little bit. And kind of shorten it up a little bit. But just to kind of let you know a little bit. And uh, I, years ago, let's, start, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we go any further. It's always safe to pray before you say too much. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Dear Lord Jesus, I pray this evening that you would please open up our minds, open up our hearts, Father, and I pray this evening that you would please fill us all with the Holy Spirit so we can all get what we need, Father, and I pray that uh, you would get all the praise and all the glory, and it's only a miracle that I'm here tonight. It's only a miracle that we're here tonight, and Lord, it's only your grace that we're here. And Lord, if it wasn't for your grace and your mercy... Lord, I don't, you only know where we would be. And Lord, I thank you for letting us be here. Thank you for letting us be in around this pulpit and giving me this opportunity to preach again. And I thank you for it, Father. It's a great privilege. It's a great joy. It's a great pleasure. Thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name I pray and for his sake, amen. Uh, before I preach tonight, I just thought maybe I ought to just give you my testimony. When I was a little boy... I, go, I went to kindergarten. My dad was a sheep herder. Uh, I couldn't tell my testimony to anybody. I still have a hard time telling it. I still have a difficult time. I uh, only tell it to folks I love. <laughs> and, uh, but I, uh, when I was a small boy and went to kindergarten, I failed kindergarten. I failed it. I mean, to fail a kindergarten is pretty rough, you know. <laughs> But I failed kindergarten, went on, went to the first grade, and I didn't learn how to read. I, I still have a thing that they called dyslexis, I can't pronounce it, dyslexis or something like that. I'm sure that's probably what I had. And I went to the second grade and didn't learn how to read, write, or spell, or anything, and went to the third grade, and then I went to the fourth grade, and... Flunked to fourth grade, went through it twice. I'm 12 years old. And uh, I didn't learn anything. Man, I, 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 I just went through that class. I threw airplanes across that class. I went to the principal's office. I didn't learn anything. Right in the middle of the year, the school, the teacher said, I resign, I quit. Nathan, I, he's just too much I can't stand to teach him. I, I was not a mean boy. But I was a dumb boy. <laughs> and uh, I would uh, go, I got, finally got up to the fifth grade. And in the fifth grade, I still couldn't read, still couldn't write. And the teacher refused to teach me anymore. I was now 12 years old. And at that time, Harvey Springer had a school in Denver, Colorado. Harvey Springer had a private school. And he sent me to that private school. So I went to the private school to give me a test and he said, he can't read, write, or spell. Let's put him back in the first grade. So I go back to the first grade at 12 years old. Now this actually happened. I went back to the first grade at 12 years old. And uh, of course, I go that year in the first grade and I'm head and shoulders above everybody else. Then at the next year, I'm 13, I go to the second grade. And then the next year, I'm 14, I go to the third grade. How old are you? 13. What grade are you in? Eight. I was in the third grade. And then the next year, 
I went to the fourth grade. I'm 15 years old now. I'm 15 years old. I'm getting ready to go into the fifth grade. That year, my birthday is June the 16th. I had working a job, making money, and bought me a car. And drove it to the fifth grade. I'm 16 years old. I can't read, I can't write, I can't spell. And therefore, you can't do nothing. If you can't read, write, and spell, you can't do nothing. There's nothing you can do. Just forget it. You, think you can't do anything. So I drove up one day, drove up the first day in school, went in and sat down on my desk. You know, it's a psychological thing that goes on of some kind. I don't know what it is, but something happens, you know. So I cried about it for years. I would cry about it coming up as a kid. So I thought, well, I need to get a bunch of jokes about it. I need to get a few good jokes about my situation. Here you go. Now, this is just a joke. <laughs> I would go to school, and all the kids would put their apples on my desk. They thought I was the teacher. <laughs> Here's another one. It's just a joke now. You might as well laugh. You've, I've cried plenty. <laughs> uh, the teacher said, Nathan is the power of my class. He's a blooming idiot. <laughs> well, we might as well laugh. What are you going to do? <laughs> two weeks into the fifth grade, two weeks into the fifth grade, my uh, teacher looked out the window, and I'd got all the little kids. See, I'm 16 years old. I mean, they're like this, man. And I said, you, I want to see how many of you can get in my car. <laughs> I had 28 of them in my car. <laughs> I mean, the whole playground was in my car. <laughs> the teacher looked out the window, and she said, oh, no, he'll kill them all. <laughs> she, she called my dad on the telephone and says, Mr. Bemis, you cannot send that 16-year-old boy to the fifth grade. It won't work. It just won't work. So I spent two weeks into the fifth grade. And then my dad says, well, uh, what am I going to do with him? Well, I, there's a class that's a retarded class up in the high school, there's a retarded class up there that has six kids in it. And I said, Daddy, are you going to put me in that class? He says, yes, you're going to go to that class. I went to that class. And there's six other retarded kids there in that class with them, and I'm there right there with them. Now, that does something to you. I don't know what, but <laughs> it does something to you. And that was it. I was there a whole year. I was there in that recorded class a whole year again. I was in that retarded class a, another year. You know, finally, they gave me a test that really made me feel good. And it just really just soothed everything out for my heart, mind, and soul. They had one of these tests, you know, where, where the teacher would ask you what you want to be when you grow up. So they give you all this little test where you take all these blocks and put it in these holes and these little things and all, and all these blocks and squares and all that, all that stuff and that's some kind of test. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anyway, they come back and our teacher was sitting there and all of us six kids were sitting around there and he'd say, now you want to be this, Billy, when you grow up. Now you want to be this when you grow up. And then he looked at mine and says... Nathan wants to be a housewife when he grows up. <laughs> and you said, how, how does that help you? Now, I'll tell you how to help me. I thought, these guys are just as crazy and nutty as I am. <laughs> They're wacko. It's all right, we're all in the same boat, let's go for it. And that really helped my heart. <laughs> really did. Just help out. Just, just made everything okay for a long time. I went into the 10th grade. 
I can't read, write, or spell in the 10th grade. And at the 10th grade, they said, Nathan, I got on a football team, and I could outrun anybody on the football team at 19 years old. I'm 19 years old, and I'm in the 10th grade. I can outrun anybody on that team. I mean, I could clean their plow. And they said, he's too old to be playing on the football team. So he can't play. So I said to my buddy, this school is out of it. I'm going to join the Navy. I joined the Navy. At 19, I'm drinking and cussing, swearing, getting drunk. I joined the Navy, and God saves my soul. I stopped drinking. I stopped cussing, and my whole life changed from darkness to light, and God gave me a purpose for living. And the first thing the Holy Spirit said to me, I had a Gideon Bible. Somebody give me a Gideon Bible. I think it was that guy up in the service men said, give me a Gideon Bible. I couldn't read that thing for not love nor money. But I opened up that Gideon Bible, and I didn't get a lump right there in my throat. But when I heard the word read, when I heard the word read my whole life, it was like a cuss word. It was worse than a cuss word. I just soon fight as read. Literally. Fight, let's go, man. That's going to be fun. But to read, I'd get a lump right there and choke me to death. And I would, I would leave your presence like a bullet if you said the word read. If you looked at me and said read. Well, I, I didn't want nobody to know I couldn't read. I didn't want nobody in the world to know that. So I get that lump. Open up my, that Gideon New Testament and the Holy Spirit says, read. Hey, the lump ain't there. Yes, the lump ain't there. And he said, read. Yes, yes, yes. Flippity flop, 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 flop. And I went through it that way. Finally, God showed me how to read the thing. Then I went to Dr. Ruckman's school. Dr. Ruckman says, you're going to take Greek and Hebrew. I said, good thing he don't know. <laughs> or he would never have said that. And I'm sitting in a Greek class. He's going over the Greek and Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Epsilon, Zeta, Eta, Theta, Iota, Kappa, Lambda, Mu, Nu, Kasi, Amaran, Pi, Rho, Sigma, Tau, Upsilon, Phi, Ki, Psi, Omega. That's the, that's the Greek alphabet. If you didn't know what it was, but <laughs> what difference does it make? The difference does it make, it taught me how to read that book right there. And that book right there is the, is the words of God Almighty. Those are His words. His words. Don't you tell me what that book is not a great, wonderful, mighty, precious book. See, it's a pure miracle. It's a pure miracle that I'm here tonight talking to you people, preaching to you people. A miracle from God Almighty that I'm here preaching at you. But I thank God for His grace and His mercy in saving my soul and calling me to preach His book. Amen. Now, that has to do with uh, Proverbs chapter 3. <laughs> now I'll take your Bible and turn to Proverbs chapter 3 now. So uh, I... I give you that just to kind of remind you what God can do. If he did that for me, he can do more for you than that. All right, Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. Pick up verse 6. Proverbs 3, 6. In all thy ways, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Now, don't you think I know that verse is a good verse? In all thy ways, acknowledge him. Acknowledge him. And he shall do what? What shall he do? Direct thy paths. Be not wise in thy own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Now also notice in uh, Proverbs chapter 3. Let's go back to verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Yeah, see, if you haven't got no brains to trust in, you can always trust in the Lord. Now, if you've got brains, you're liable to trust your brains instead of the Lord. Better be careful, but 
You can trust your veins instead of the Lord. And then you'll really be in trouble. Because you think, might think you have some brains. Because you ain't got no brains. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Trust in the Lord. You might trust in your money. I don't know who that guy is, but I'll point back there in just in case I can hit him. <laughs> you might trust in your money. That'd be a terrible thing to trust in. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Easier said than done. But that's what God wants you to do. God wants you to trust in Him. Don't you trust in your talent. Don't you trust in your good looks. Don't trust in your education. Don't trust in nothing but God. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not unto thy own understanding. You see what I'm saying? You've got to trust in His understanding, not your own. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thy own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. Now I want to preach on, right there in verse 6, where it says, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. What does it mean? If you acknowledge God on the job, some of you out there on the job, and you're driving a truck, you acknowledge God and say, I'm a Christian, I'm saved, I'm on the side with Jesus. If you acknowledge God, what's he going to do according to the verse? Now, now look at the verse. What's God going to do if you acknowledge him? He's going to direct your paths. So when you come across somewhere and you go like this, the Lord's going to say, I'll direct it. He takes you this way. Why? He's directing your paths. He's not letting you go the wrong way. He's letting you go the right way because you acknowledge Him. You acknowledge God in everything in life and He'll direct your paths. You want to go the wrong way? Do you, you want to go the wrong way? Do you want to just completely mess up and just mess your whole life up and turn it into a rotten apple? Or do you want to go God's way? God's what? God's what? Now, all right, take your Bible and turn to Psalms chapter 18 and look at verse 30. I want to show you something about God's way. Psalms chapter 18 and verse 30. Turn to it. Psalms chapter 18 and verse 30. And this is what it says. Psalms chapter 18 and verse 30 says, As for God, His way is what? Perfect. Then God's way is perfect. My way, oh man, that thing might turn into mud. No tell what to do. I mean, it just might be a hellhole. Come on, folks. Come on. Stay with me. But God's way is a perfect way. Don't you want God to direct your path? All right. Here it goes again. Take your Bible and turn to Psalms chapter 25 and pick up verse 4. Now this is just an introduction to my message. I'm trying to introduce you to the God's way, His paths. Uh, Psalms chapter 25 and pick up verse 4. Show me thy ways, O Lord, and teach me thy paths. So what's the prayer? The prayer is, Lord, show me your ways. And Lord, teach me your paths. Lord, teach them to me. Teach them to me. All right. Again, Psalms 25 and pick up verse 10. Psalms 25, verse 10. All the paths of the Lord are... Now, all. Circle the word all. All the paths of the Lord are what? Mercy and truth. And to such as keep his covenants and his testimonies. All the paths of the Lord. How many of you want God's paths? He, you want God to direct you every time through life. Every way, every time, every decision, every circumstance, every path. You want God to do that? Then acknowledge him. You want God to do that? Acknowledge him. You want God to do that? Acknowledge him. It's a perfect. It's perfect. It's perfect. Then it's his way. All right. Uh, again. Uh, on and on and on and on you go. Look at David. Look at Psalms 23. Look at Psalms 23. Look what David said. Psalms chapter 23. And look at uh, verse 3. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of what? 
then what are God's ways? What are God's paths? They're what, folks? Give me one more time. Righteousness, righteousness, righteousness. So, you know what I want? I want God's paths. I want God to direct me. And I want Him to get H in every one of my paths because they're His paths. And they're perfect and they're precious. All right? Then what am I supposed to do? I'm to acknowledge God. Acknowledge God. What's that? Witness on the job. Now, question. The place you work, men, I want you men to look at me. The place you work, do, does this guy and this guy and this guy know that you're a Christian born again? I only heard one amen. There are two or three more. You acknowledge God by letting this guy know you are a Christian. You're saved. You acknowledge God. He'll direct your path. I want God to direct my path. Everybody's around me. I get, I sit down at the dinner table and all them guy, unsaved fellows around me. You ought to do something that every one of them know that you're a born again Christian, that you're saved and going to heaven when you die. Every single man in this room, excluding now. Okay? All right. Now that I said that, now that I said that, I want to say something about God's paths. God's paths are sometimes lonely. Lonely. Take your Bible and turn to the book of Genesis. And turn to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. I say sometimes God's paths are lonely. Genesis 37, and pick up verse 23. Verse 23 says, And it come to pass, when Joseph was come unto his brethren, that they stripped Joseph of his coat, uh, and his coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in the pit. Here's Joseph, down in the pit. And they took and ripped his coat off of him. And he was all alone in the pit. Now take your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50. And look what it says in verse 20. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. Are you there? Say amen. amen. Genesis 50, verse 20 says, But as for you, ye thought it evil against me but God met it unto good to bring to pass it is this day to save much of the people alive and God thought it what good so God looks down and God says I got a blueprint here I got a blueprint and I got a big blueprint and I need somebody to save the nation of Israel and I'm going to go down in Egypt and I, I want to take Joseph down there. I'm going to take Joseph down to Egypt. And Joseph is going to be the king of Egypt. And he's going to deliver all the children of Israel. And that is my plan. But you know something? Joseph, when he was down in the pit, couldn't see the blueprint of God. He couldn't see what God was doing. He's down in the pit and he thought that his brothers had forsaken him and wanted to kill him and throw him in the pit all alone to die. Do you know sometimes a Christian is down in the pit and he's all by himself all alone. I'm going to tell you something. You know what I think I've learned? I think I've learned that I have about that many real absolute friends that if I got in trouble... They would really absolutely do anything to get me out of trouble. And I about that many. I'm counting them on my both hands. Now, you know, you see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? You say, what do you mean, preacher? Okay, Brother Martin, I get in trouble and I need ten thousand dollars. Can I borrow it from you? He was awful slow. <laughs> See, it's slow, man, slow. You see what I mean, though? I mean, 
10,000 big ones. He'd have to borrow it from the bank. <laughs> see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? I mean, when you get right down to it, when you get right down to it, how many of you ladies, how many of you ladies look at your husband and say, I don't think he understands me. I don't think he does either. I don't think no man understands you. <laughs> no. I don't understand any woman on the face of this earth. They think different. They don't think like a man. A man thinks different than a woman. And a man says, what is she doing that for? He can't figure it out for love and her money. Tell you something. You know what a woman wants? A woman wants a man to understand her. Come on, ladies. I said a woman wants a man to understand her. He ain't ever going to understand you. He's not going to do it. He's not going to do it. He's not going to do it. He can say... I just can't figure out. I don't know. I can't figure her out. That don't mean he don't love you. That don't mean that he doesn't want to make you happy. That doesn't mean that he doesn't care for you. That just means that the only one that's really going to understand you like you is the Lord Jesus Christ. And nobody's ever going to understand you that much. And so many times you're going to feel like you're all alone. And he's going to be sitting on the other side of the room and you're going to feel like you're all alone. But you know something? That goes both ways. Do you know sometimes a woman don't understand a man? She said, I can't understand him. No, a woman don't think like a man. She's not supposed to. God didn't make her that way. If God made my wife like me and we were both alike, I would kill her. Absolutely. Thank God I don't have to live with a man like that. See? She's going to feel like she's all alone sometimes. But my Savior don't have that relationship with her. She's never alone. Sometimes the way of God will be awful lonely. You ever been in a crowd of people? In a crowd of people? I mean, big old crowd. And you felt like you was all alone? Felt like you was all alone? In a big crowd of people? Come on. You believe that? Sometimes the path of God is lonely. But it's still the path of God. Down in the pit. Down in the pit, Joseph says... My brothers hate me. My brothers hate me. That's the path of God. He don't see the blueprint. God up in heaven has got the blueprint open and saying, Stick with it. Stick with it. Joseph, stick with it. I'll do, I'll make you the king of Egypt. But Joseph don't hear that. All Joseph hears is his brother saying, We hate you. Who do you think you are anyway? They took him up out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites. Sold their own brother. You know, sometimes the path of God not only will be lonely, it will be dangerous. Write it down. Take your pen, write it down. Sometimes the path of God is lonely. Sometimes the path of God is dangerous. It's dangerous. And it's still the path to God. It's perfect. No error, no problem, no mistake with God. And yet it's dangerous. Very dangerous. His own brother sold him to the Ishmaelites. So here's, here's Joseph. Being a sold as a slave down into Egypt. And he's saying, oh, what's going to happen to me? Oh, God, what's going to happen to me down into Egypt as a slave? And that was the path of God. See, sometimes it's only, sometimes it's dangerous. Oh yeah, it's dangerous, man, dangerous. 
dangerous. Look at here. I was driving down the road, Dunray, with three preachers. Had three preachers with me, and we come back from a preacher's conference. And we come along this, we was on an interstate, and we come along this here little uh, rest stop, a rest stop there. And we pulled in this rest stop, and I had some bunch of tracks on me. And we got out of the car, out of the car to rest stop. I walked across the rest stop, and there was a guy standing right there. I walked up to him and says, uh, here's something you ought to read, tell you how to stay out of hell and how to go to heaven when you die. He said, I don't want it. I said, well, it just tell you how to get to heaven. He said, I told you I don't want it. Okay, okay. All right, all right, all right. But I just wanted to let you know it'd keep you out of hell. He said, I told you I didn't want it. I said, I, okay, I know that. I know that. I, all right. I walked, walked away from him. He started walking after me. He walked right behind me. Kept, he said, I told you I didn't want it. I said, yeah, I know I heard you say that, but it's still it's a good thing to have. And, and he's right there yelling in my face. He's about five inches away from me like that. And I come over here, and there's a big old cliff right down there like that, and it's down about 50 feet. And I think, he's going to push me over the edge. He's going to push me over the edge. And I said, come on, Brother Roach. Come on, you guys going to help me or what? What are you guys doing? Come on. I mean, he's screaming, yelling, I told you I don't want it. I said, oh, yeah, I know, I know, I know. And that guy, and I said, Brother Roach says, uh, come on, Brother Remus, come on, let's go. And I said, yeah, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. And I run around like this, and I'm running towards the car, and he chased me toward the car, and I jump in the car, and he runs up in the car and sticks his face. He says, I told you I didn't want it. We took the car up and down, go away. And those guys laughed, you know, they had a big deal. They thought it was really, you know, and I thought, Phew. I was a close one. But you know something? When you hunt out a gospel track and you tell a man he's dying and going to hell, you're in a dangerous spot too. How many of you have ever had a brother or a sister or a mother or a father, some of you love dearly? My brother Gary, I've asked you to pray for him. Him, him and I, that's bad. My brother and I were sitting at the kitchen table, and I said, Gary, uh, the Bible says in Psalms that the fool has said in his heart there is no God. He's an atheist, you know. And he said, do you think I'm a fool? And I thought, uh-oh, what have I done now? And then I, I was quiet a minute, and he said, I'll just leave. Yeah, that cuts you right to the heart. That cuts you right to the heart. And then he says, That Bible thinks I'm a fool. And I said underneath my breath, Amen and amen. I didn't say it to him. Because I knew he'd just jump up screaming. But that Bible says my own brother's a fool. He said to the fool in Luke chapter 12, he said, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, and then shall these things, who shall these things be that thou hast provided? I call him a fool. You say that's dangerous? That's dangerous. Sometimes the will of God is not only lonely, but sometimes it's dangerous. Okay. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood up. We won't bow. And what would happen to them if they, did, they didn't bow? What was going to happen to them, folks? How many? Well, here, who don't know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Why, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went where? Into the fiery, 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 fiery furnace. Amen? Was that dangerous? Was that the will of God? Was that the path of God Almighty? Yeah, but it was dangerous. Dangerous. Sometimes the path of God Almighty is dangerous. Again, take your Bible and notice in Psalms chapter 105. Psalms 105. Look at verse 17. Psalms 105, verse 17. Not only is the path of God sometimes lonely, 
Not only is the path of God sometimes dangerous, but sometimes the path of God is this. Psalm 105. Now let's pick up Joseph again. All right. Uh, Psalms 105. Pick up verse 17. It says, He sent a man before them, even who? Joseph. Now, I want you to take, and I want you to underline in verse 17, He sent, He sent, He sent. But He sent him in a pit down there where there was no water, and down there in a pit where there wasn't anything to drink. That pit's a type of hell. That pit's a type of hell. What if Joseph would give up in the pit? You ever been in a place that you thought was like a pit of hell? That's what Joseph was. Now, notice again. Before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they did what? Hurt with fetters and was laid in irons. What'd they do? They put, a, they put a thing around there like that and tighten that thing down there like that until the blood came. And put a one around there and tighten that thing down until the blood came. Did the same thing on his feet. He's hurt. He was hurt. He hurt. That's the path of God. That's the way of God. Sometimes it's lonely, sometimes it's dangerous, and sometimes it's painful. Did you get that? Sometimes it's painful. And that's God's way. That's God's path. And He's directing you because you acknowledge Him in all your ways. And it's a painful path from God. Yeah, look at here. You ever meet some Christian that gets up in the morning and they get up in the morning and they're full of pain. And they go all day long and go to bed and get up the next morning and they're still full of pain. And they spend their whole lives full of pain, full of pain, full of pain. That is the path of God. You say, I don't understand it. Don't comprehend it. I know, but sometimes it's lonely, sometimes it's dangerous, and sometimes it's painful. Take your Bible and turn to the book of Acts. I'll show you to you again. Take your Bible and turn to the book of Acts. And turn to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Sometimes the path of God is painful. Acts chapter 9. And in Acts chapter 9, look what it says in verse uh, 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must... What, folks? Suffer. Suffer for my name's sake. Now, let's see a few of these. And this will happen to a Christian before the, if the Lord tarries. It's going to come his way too. Take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 16 and watch it again. Acts chapter 16, pick up verse 22. Acts 16, 22. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Whoever received such a charge thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas did what? What they do? Prayed, and what else they do? They sang. So what they do? Here's Paul and Silas out there preaching the gospel. And they said, Prepare the praise, turn the bar. And they got their clothes beat off of them, and they got a whip on them, and they got thrown in jail. And what did they do when they got in jail? You know what some folks do? Oh, God's forsaken me. Oh, God, what are you doing? Oh, God, why am I in jail for preaching the gospel? Not Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas says, This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. The treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. And the whole prison heard him. Would that have been you? Oh, would you just say, oh, God, this must not be God's will. Oh, we must have preached in the street and got backslidden and we just went out there and preached when we shouldn't have preached. You know, sometimes the, the path of God is lonely. Sometimes the path of God is dangerous. 
Sometimes the path of God is painful. Now, you got it? You got it? I'll tell you what it's like. Here's a woman. She comes to church. She cries. Every Sunday, faithful. She'd be in her pew. Dependable, faithful. Won't miss a spot. Pray. Read your Bible. And her husband leaves her. Drops her high in the sky and rocks off and leaves her. And there she is all by herself. Don't tell me that don't happen. Because it happens. What would she say? Oh God, what's wrong? Oh God, what's wrong? Oh God, why are you doing this to me? Oh God, why are you doing this to me? The path of God sometimes is lonely. Sometimes the path of God is dangerous. Sometimes the path of God is painful. Amen and amen. She's in the path of God. She said, what do you say about preacher? I say this. Further along we'll know all about it. Further along we'll understand why. Cheer up my brother, live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. This place is not a place of understanding. This is a place of faith. Oh, well, there's the place of understanding. You'll understand it when you get to heaven. You won't understand it down here. But you'll understand it over there. So you keep trusting God. You be like Joseph. Say, I may be in a pit, God. I may be in a pit. But I'm going to do just what Joseph did. I'm going to stand by you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to honor you. I'm going to serve you. Regardless of what happens. Because sometimes the path of God is lonely. Sometimes the path of God is dangerous. Sometimes the path of God is painful. And last of all, sometimes the path of God is unsuccessful in the eyes of this world. You know what people say in this world? They say, well, if you make money, that's a-okay. It come out all right. As long as you make money, that's all right. And the world says, well, he got rich. He left a bunch of money for his children, so he's okay. it's okay. But you know something? You can, you, let's say you got down to the end and you didn't have a dime to your name and you're flat broke and you didn't have nothing to leave to your children and you didn't have nothing to uh, take you to the grave. Well, all you had was your Christian life and your Christian walk and your Christian treasures in heaven. You've got something, brother, you've got something. See, the world looks at it different than you and I look at it. The world looks at it different than God looks at it. So God's path, sometimes in this world, you may die penniless. Not a, not a penny to your name. I'm going to give you an illustration. One time there was a missionary, he went overseas, and he spent 30 years on the mission field. And he went over there and spent his whole life, lost his health, and his wife died and his children died. And he come back on the boat. And when he got back on the boat, he walked down the ramp. And as he walked down the ramp, he was thinking somebody was going to meet him. And nobody was there to meet him. And he walked down there and stood and looked around, hoping to be somebody. He says, here's a missionary coming home and spending 30 years of his life on the mission field. And nobody here to greet him. He lost his wife and his family and everything he has. And here he is and there's not a soul to meet him when I come home. I'm home and there's nobody here. And then off the ship came one of the presidents and he had been over to Africa and he was hunting on Big Africa Hunt and he'd come off of the boat and there was a band down there playing and singing and hundreds and thousands of people was to meet the president of the United States as he walked off the boat. And that poor missionary walked around and says, Lord... I come all the way home and there's not one soul here to greet me and no joy, no singing, no fan, no nothing. God looked down over to heaven and whispered in that missionary's ear and said, You're not home yet. You're not home yet. Yes! Yes! Wait till that missionary gets into New Jerusalem and gets home. There'll be a band playing. 
there'll be the music there and they'll be waiting and hollering and saying, he did it, he did it, he did it, he did it, he did it. That's what you can't see. You don't see all that yet. All you see is the pit. That's all you see. Don't quit in the pit. All the way over. Maybe before it's over, God will make you the king. Don't quit in the pit. Every eye closed and every head bowed. Sometimes the path of God is lonely. Sometimes the path of God is dangerous. Sometimes the path of God is painful. Sometimes the path of God is unsuccessful in the eyes of this world. But Christian, you don't see the whole plan of God yet. One of these days God's going to show you the whole plan. So you be faithful. You keep right on loving God. You keep right on serving God. You keep right on reading your Bible. You keep right on putting out gospel tracts. And you keep right on praising God until that trumpet sounds or you go through the valley of death to meet Him. You be faithful. And don't you quit. Maybe there's somebody here tonight say, Preacher, I feel so much like quitting. Don't you quit. Don't you quit. You be faithful. You get lonely. You learn how to face that loneliness. And you get on your hands and knees and say, Thank you, Jesus, for never leaving me. Because he's never left you and he never will leave you. You take the pain. And you take the danger. And you take the unsuccessfulness for him. Dear Lord Jesus, pray you speak to each and every heart. Maybe there's somebody here that's lost. Maybe he has that same road, and his road's going to end up in hell. Father, I pray that you would give him grace to repent and get on the right road. In Jesus' precious name I pray, and for his sake, amen. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. 377. 377 in your hymnal. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take thy cross and follow, follow me. Where he leads me, I will follow. Now listen to me, listen to me. In all thy ways acknowledge him. Now, you know what that is? That's you're to say, yes, I'm on the side with Jesus Christ. He's my Savior. And everybody around you ought to know that. Everybody. You see, I'm a street secret Christian. Yeah, but you're the wrong kind of Christian if you are. You say, can I be a Christian and be a secret Christian? Yeah, but the wrong kind. Be the right kind. You want him to direct your paths. And when he does, they may be lonely, they may be painful, they may be dangerous, and they may be unsuccessful. But thank God they're perfect and they're his paths. And that's the ones you want. That's the one you want. You take his path. It's ten times, million times better than any other path. Brother Martin, come on. I'll go with him through the garden. I'll go with him the through the garden. Make sure you yield and the Lord. I'll go with him through the garden. I'll go with him, with him all the way. Sing the chorus, sing it as a prayer. Where he leads me, I.
priceless message for us, and I'm sure that you've had your uh, bell rung more than once this week. We've had four services now, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and I'm sure the Lord has rung your bell real good, and you need a little bit more to carry you on through. Things are pretty wicked on the outside, and to keep you good and strong, you need to come back and uh, get all you can now. You've got three on Sunday. You've got one tomorrow night. Get everything you can. Get loaded up for the days ahead. God's been good to us. Uh, and we're just thankful beyond words for the preaching we heard tonight. Close in prayer, Brother Frank Troyan.